Okay, back again this week. I thought I'd go after some more literature. Uh, this time it, it comes out of their uh, 12 and 12, uh, which, uh, believe it or not, I remember in some meetings there were certain old timers that would actually claim that they weren't as gung ho about the 12 and 12 as they were uh, the first 164 pages. You know, you've always got the first 164 page purist, uh, but they were saying, you know, the 12 and 12 is just one man's opinion. Uh, the 12 and 12 is just one man's opinion. What do you think the, uh, what do you think the big book was if it wasn't just primarily one man's opinion? That's all it, uh, any of it is. But there were certain people that would say they loved the 12 and 12 so much because it broke down every step, uh, you know, even more, uh, I, I guess you could say in finer detail was, was what they were, were saying. But uh, you know, uh, there was always some kind of, you know, in every AA group and in every AA meeting, there's always somebody that's trying to adopt a more extreme cult-like position than the other cult members. In other words, I'm more cult-like than the other cult members are, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Uh, kind of like the little story in the back of the book about acceptance is the answer to all my problems. That used to create all kinds of stirs if you read that in, a, in an AA meeting because somebody would have to pop up that it's not part of the sacred holy 164 fucking pages and all that other thing squeaky chair again, but uh, it was an interesting thing that uh, uh, I found here that I decided to go after, uh, because to me there's a little bit of a confession uh, at work and at play in this, and uh, <clears throat> I can uh, put some of my own little thoughts into, my, I mean, as far as my own experiences with this, I can put some of that into it as well, but it's in there little 12 and 12, and it's on step two, which you know, it used to just make me cringe with anger having to sit in meetings like so many of the other topics because you, you, there were so many uh, statements that were utterly, totally uh, missing any kind of logic or missing any kind of real context to them whatsoever. You know, over and over again, as I've said before on here, it's just these bold assertions about this is the way the world works, like you can't question it and like you can't uh, take a different opinion of it either. Which, by the way, is a telltale sign of a religion or a cult when it can't be questioned, criticized, argued about, and debated. Uh, but what I thought was interesting is it says, Consider next the plight of those who once had faith but have lost it. There will be those who have drifted into indifference, those filled with self-sufficiency who have cut themselves off, those who have become prejudiced against religion. Isn't it funny? You can't have legitimate criticisms of religion. You can't have uh, legitimate criticisms of maybe what goes on in organized churches or anything like that. It's just you drifted over into self-sufficiency. You became indifferent. You uh, you did whatever. But it's it's ultimately your fault that you're not going to be able to get sold on the AA cult religion because, you know, you believed in the delusion of self-sufficiency, which, by the way, uh, without self-sufficiency, uh, you wouldn't be able to function very much in this world. I mean, granted, uh, everybody is somewhat dependent upon other people in order to survive in the world. I mean, if you have a family or if you, even if you're just a, a person who works for an employer, you're dependent upon the economy. You're dependent upon the people in charge of it. You're dependent upon them to make rational business decisions and not screw you over, which results in a layoff. So nobody, in my opinion, actually labors under this idea that they exist alone in the world without any uh, without any kind of uh, interdependency whatsoever. It's another one of his sweeping uh, bold assertions. But I, I do think it's interesting that he starts out with, well, you know, you drifted over into indifference. Well, maybe you're a busy individual that has a lot going on in your life, and you realize that there's two things that can happen this month when the bills come in the mail. One, I can pay the bill, so it means I have to really sit down here and budget out my finances here so I can pay these bills off. Or two, I'll just sit and pray about it and sit in AA meetings and ignore it. Uh, of the two, I think uh, it's pretty obvious what the answer should be. But uh, those who are downright defiant because God has failed to fulfill their demands. Well, you know, a lot of people who drift away from the idea of religion or the idea of people who have drifted away from the idea of faith whatsoever uh, might not necessarily be uh, from the standpoint of, well, God didn't make me my Christmas wish list, so... I'm, you know, I'm not going to have nothing to do with him anymore. I'm defiant now. I hate religion. You know, I've not known very many uh, in my life or encountered anybody who's a non-believer uh, that comes at religion from that particular standpoint. There are people who have endured innumerable horrifying tragedies uh, and, and horrible things like the loss of a loved one or the loss of a family member or just people who have in general a, a very horrible thing happen to them 
that uh, might dissuade them from religious belief. You know, not too long ago, uh, when I was driving, when I was out driving, I had the radio station tuned over to NPR, and they were talking about there was a guy being interviewed that was uh, molested as a child by a priest. And he had talked about the fact that he felt ashamed of himself, that he never told anyone about it at the time, uh, that the priest was very well liked in the church, that uh, they did kind of screw up his faith a little bit because there was the, the nagging question on his mind, well, where was God when this kind of thing happened? Uh, of course, AA people like Bill W. here you know, would, would probably shun that off as, well, you know, you didn't get what you wanted out of life, you're self-willed, you put yourself in that position to get molested by a priest, so, you know, that's your problem. And, you know, they, they blame you for every single doubt, for every single thing that happens, it's always your fault in AA. I've reiterated that numerous times. Whenever I see something like this or hear something like this, it always brings me back to that really infamous quote that was on a concentration camp wall, I believe it was either on a wall or something in one of the Nazi concentration camps, uh, where the person said, if God exists, he will have to beg me for his forgiveness. But anyway, sometimes can AA experience help all of those that still find, uh, well, wait a minute, I'm reading that wrong, the, the print was small. Can AA experience, uh, all these may find, tell all these people that they may still find a faith that works. In other words, this isn't about quit drinking, it's about finding faith, because you're saying you can't quit drinking without faith. So you've excluded a whole bunch of people right here from the get-go. But of course, this entire uh, chapter here is more or less telling you that if you've got a problem with the religious spiritual angle, which they call spirituality, but let's just face it, it's cult religion. But they're telling you that if you've got a problem with this right here, that you've got to find some kind of faith that's going to work for you, or you can't quit drinking. Uh, superstitious mumbo jumbo. Sometimes AA comes harder to those who have lost or rejected faith than those who never had any faith at all. Uh, well, I, I imagine so. I imagine people who have drifted away from church due to a myriad and multitude of reasons are not going to be so quick to swallow another cult dogmatic religious text or a tenement. They try to appeal to this base thing and you, you know, well, if you left religion once, it's, it's because uh, God didn't do what you wanted it to do. That's why you got angry at religion. You know, it's a, a straw man, literally. They're telling you the only reason you could have left church uh, is because of self-sufficiency or, or just this, this or just this anger uh, because you didn't get your Christmas wish list. Sometimes I wonder about every accusation being a confession here, although I doubt very seriously, you know, if Bill's story he tells this story about how he was all despaired and how, you know, he had fallen apart. God didn't do nothing for him. And then the... Uh, Ebby over there says, just choose your own conception of God. And, of course, the icy intellectual mountain melted, which is such a crock of shit. You know, it's just more proof that AA is anti-intellectual, anti-thinking, anti-anything reasoning. But then again, that's the only way a cult religion can suck you in. you got to give up your reasoning. you got to give up your logic. you got to give up your ideas of self-sufficiency. That's what he's aiming at doing right here. For those who have rejected faith or lost faith think they have tried faith and found it wanting. They've tried the way of faith and the way of no faith, since both ways prove bitterly disappointing. Well, there again, we've got a false dichotomy here, the way of faith, the way of no faith. I don't think uh, most people who are who are caught up in a, in a terrible addiction like alcohol, like, like literally when I was really physically dependent on alcohol, the only thing I was thinking about was a, a way to get out of it, even before AA. Okay, the only thing I was thinking of is I got to get control of this thing. It wasn't so much that I was saying I'm trying the way of no faith versus the way of faith. It was the fact that the way of faith never did much for me. Uh, there was no really big thing that happened to me that made me walk away from the Catholic upbringing I had. There was no real uh, big major event in my life that caused me to say, you know, I just don't feel this way any longer. There, uh, as far as, you know, the, he'll talk about letting go of that absolutely of old ideas. I didn't just let go of all my old ideas about faith one morning. You know, I didn't wake up one morning and say, you know, I just don't agree with these things anymore. It was a gradual process over time until one day I just realized that I didn't have any faith in that any longer, that it meant nothing to me anymore. Uh, but it didn't have nothing to do with, well, you know, I'm not getting what I want, so I'm going to go with no faith here, you know. Um, and it wasn't bitterly, in both ways, by the way, are not bitterly disappointing. That's another bullshit thing. In fact, here we are with an interesting dichotomy here. He's saying the way of faith is bitterly disappointing. The way of no faith is bitterly disappointing. 
He's not saying there is any middle road, but of course what he's really saying is you got to you got to pick this this middle way right here, which is no middle way at all. It's the cult religion of AA. Uh, the roadblocks of indifference, fancied with self-sufficiency, prejudice, and defiance, often prove more solid and formidable for those people than any erected by the unconvinced agnostic or even the militant atheist. You know, he's just trying to be so flarefully dramatic here. Uh, as far as obstacles and roadblocks are concerned, I think most religious people who are no longer religious don't have this prejudice against religious. It's not like uh, that they hear about somebody being religious and immediately they go off the deep end. What I'm seeing here, uh, is what, what he's talking about here is I came to AA because I had a drinking problem. I got to AA and I said, look, I got a drinking problem. I need something done about it. And they start talking this spiritual claptrap, this spiritual mumbo jumbo, and the person said rightfully, "Look, and I grew up religious. I, 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 I've been religious in my lifetime. That's not going to work for me. So, you know, I came here to quit drinking first and foremost. And then, of course, they get this kind of cult bullshit rammed down their throat. Well, you know, you used to be religious. Well, you're going to have to get religious again. You, you don't need your old religion. You need to find a God, any God, any, your own conception of God. The group can be your God. Good orderly direction. Group of drunks, you know. And likely, more than likely, when people would hear that, they'd say, well, this is another dead end. This is another bullshit thing that I was told was going to help me quit drinking, and now I find out I'm being sold religion. Uh, but he's making it this dramatic thing, that it's defiant, angry, you know, whatever the fuck. Uh, you know, let me, I lost it. Religion says the existence of God can be proved. No, it doesn't. Religion never said the existence of God can be proved. Uh, the whole entire basis of religion is faith. <laughs> religion says the existence of God can be proved. I, I've never seen a religion that, that will tell me that. They'll tell you they have faith. They'll tell you that uh, they believe in God. They'll tell you that they, they, they have found proof of God. When they say they found proof of God, it's usually because of some appeal to wonderment that they say cannot be explained. But I've never seen any 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 uh, uh, priest, pope, bishop, or whatever, or whoever the hell say they absolutely uh, have 100% proof. Uh, <laughs> because if you've got 100% proof, I want to see it. I've seen certain religious people try to say, well, you know, the <clears throat> their argument literally is that because there is no proof of God, that of itself is proof. <laughs> I never did quite understand that. There's no evidence of, God, of Jesus ever existing. That proves he existed. <laughs> but religion never said that God can be proven. To my knowledge, uh, the agnostic says it cannot be proved. That is not what an agnostic says. Bill W. does not understand agnosticism at all. Agnosticism is really a fancy way of saying you don't know. The A in agnostic, agnostic knowledge, A, without, uh, without knowledge. That's saying that literally could be a God, may not be a God, I have no idea. Uh, you know, there, there is even the schools of thought that if a God exists out there, there would be no way for human mind to comprehend it. How could you comprehend it any more than an ant can comprehend my existence as a human being? Do you think fish that are deep in the sea in the ocean somewhere that have never developed eyesight down under the water, do you think they have any, any concept or understanding of, of what life is like as a human being? Do you think they could even fathom that? That would be the same thing as God, according to some agnostics that I've you know, heard, or I don't even know if they would refer to themselves as agnostic. But they're literally saying, I don't know. Where he's coming up with this kind of a statement, the agnostic says... It can't be proved. It has nothing to do with proof. It says we we have no clue. Uh, an agnostic doesn't come out and make the assertion of it can't be proved that there's a God. You just, you can't prove it. That's not what, it, what an agnostic is doing. An agnostic is saying there's no way to fully know in terms of unless we see some real concrete evidence of where something is or, you know, something there along the lines. But to say it can't be proved... Uh, that's not exactly true at all. Look up Bertrand Russell's teapot uh, for, for further, uh, how can I put it, for further clarification on an agnostic position. I mean, it can't be proved. Uh, I've never heard anybody say something can't be proved. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, if you said it can't be proved, uh, then it would be, that's a claim. Okay, that's a, <laughs> it's an idiot statement. Let me see what he's going to say. The atheist says here, the atheist claims proof of the non-existence of God. No. 
No atheist has ever claimed proof of the non-existence of God. You can't prove something that doesn't exist, first and foremost. Uh, of course, Christopher Hitchens didn't exist at the time of the 1930s, but I'm sure no atheist has ever said, I have 100% proof that God doesn't exist. Uh, the atheist position, more or less, would be, in the absence of all evidence, the default position is non-belief. If, uh, and I've reiterated this before, if you told me that there are dragons, okay, that control the universe and the skies above me, you told me that these dragons are what are responsible for the sun and the moon and the nighttime and all this other kind of thing, and I said, well, can you show me a picture of a dragon? Can you, can you give me... DNA dragon uh, underneath a microscope, or can you do something like that? And they said, oh no, you know, it's there, but you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, you can't give any physical evidence of it, but it's there. Your default answer would be, well, you know, until I see some concrete proof, I don't believe in it. So he doesn't even understand the terms agnostic, atheist, and obviously he doesn't even understand the term believer. He's saying a believer says it can be proven. The entire foundation of religion was faith, I always thought. I mean, who knows? Okay. Obviously, the dilemma of the wanderer from faith is that of profound confusion. Now, don't think so. The dilemma, if a person who wanders away from faith has a dilemma at all, it's not profound confusion. You know, he may say to himself, you know, it's an interesting idea. What is really out here? What is really beyond all of this? He might see a snippet of an article about Tesla talking about certain numbers or in vibrations and thinking to themselves, you know, I wonder about that. I, kind of interesting. It's kind of curious. You may watch something on National Geographic about multiverse theory and find it kind of fascinating, but his ultimate position, if he doesn't have faith in anything as far as a concrete faith, is going to be, I don't really know. But it's not confound, profound confusion. Bill Wilson's building another straw man here. He's saying... You don't have religion of your youth anymore because you're defiant and you're all about self-sufficiency or you're belligerent, denial, and hate-filled and angry. Uh, so you're just confused, you know. <laughs> Any number of AAs can say to this drifter, yes, we were diverted from our childhood faith too. Uh, well, according to you, your childhood faith says God can be proven. Uh, you're saying that the way of faith is actually... Uh, bitter disappointment because I don't know what I don't know why it's bitter disappointment. He just got through saying the way of no faith and faith are both bitter disappointments, and now he's saying losing your childhood faith or doing like the REM song and losing your religion is a terrible thing. Uh, the overconfidence of youth was too much for us. Of course, we were glad that good home and religious training had given us certain values. Well, first of all. Uh, what do you mean by good home and religious training? You know, I, I mean, I think uh, anybody who was ever raised in a really devout fundamentalist style Christian household can tell you it didn't necessarily give you good religious training if you have doubts about it. You, uh, what, was the, what was the song, the Harper Valley PTA, remember the song where they want to tell the woman she's wearing her skirts too short and she's drinking too much liquor and therefore she shouldn't be raising her children. And at the end of the song, she shows up at the Harper Valley PTA and she points out how every one of them is nothing but a bunch of fucking hypocrites. So, I mean, that's, what's, what's he talking about, you know? We were still sure that we ought to be fairly honest, tolerant, and just. AA is very intolerant, very unjust. Uh, and, you know, uh, we ought to be ambitious and hardworking. Religion doesn't give you ambition and hardworking. Uh, hardworking and values are something that you kind of develop over time. I mean, I always took pride that I was a hard worker in my jobs. It wasn't because of religion that I, that I ever did that. It was because there was a part of me that felt one of those things that Bill W. would call pride, uh, a sin. He would call it pride. I used to take pride in the fact that when I did a good job at work, it was pride in myself. I mean, a corporation or a company doesn't give a flying fuck about you. You know, they'll, they'll lay you off at the drop of a hat. They'll fuck you over, fire you. They'll show nepotism and favoritism. Uh, that was for my own pleasure, to be able to take pride in what I did. But, of course, according to Bill, pride is a sin. Uh, there are certain things that I've taken pride in in my life. There are certain things that I've had ambition about in life. Uh, but it had nothing to do with religious training. This guy just doesn't understand anything here. He's just making all these stupid assertions. Uh, we were still sure, let's see, we became convinced that such simple rules of fair play and decency would be enough. Well, actually, uh, yeah. Uh, rules of decency and fair play should be enough in the world. 
And it, it sadly is not because you've got every kind of crooked fucking politician and every crooked corporate overlord in the world that can't wait to fuck people over and break the backs of the little people to line his own fucking pocketbooks. So yeah, it's kind of naive to believe that fair play and decency are even, have even got a place in this world. But there again, he's saying, we were sure, we were sure. Here we go building this straw man. In other words, what he's saying in a nutshell is that you thought just by being a decent human being that'd be enough, but that ain't good enough. That ain't good enough. You gotta surrender. You gotta bow. You gotta find a power greater than yourself. You know, this <laughs> is such bullshit. As material excess success founded upon no more than these ordinary attributes began to come to us, we felt we were winning the game of life. Uh, no, no. There's a sense of pride when you when you're living on your own for the very first time and you realize you're supporting yourself. Uh, when you move past the very first apartment, you know the, the very first apartment that's got you know. Uh, beer stains all in the carpet and ashtrays everywhere, but you got your big entertainment center over there that, that plays music, but the apartment looks like crap. When you get kind of past that stage and you kind of realize, that, yo, I'm supporting myself, I'm paying my own bills, uh, I'm able to go out this weekend and buy something that I like because I got the money to do that, yeah, that, that, that's a good feeling. And he's saying this is a bad thing. Uh, why should we be bothered with theological abstractions and religious duties or with the state of our souls here or hereafter? This is, this is pure question begging. Pure question begging. He's saying that because you're having a good time in life or you're finally finding some financial stability and some financial security that you're just going to sweep aside all the, all the, uh, all the mysteries of the universe and say, I don't give a shit what happens to me when I die and all that other kind of thing. In other words, it's the same anti-materialist message that religion promotes, which is funny because Bill W. did love his, he loved his money, he loved his mistresses, and he loved making a fortune off AA, but he's telling you, if you get material success in life, you won't give a shit about your soul, which, by the way, I thought we weren't a religious program here, I thought we were spiritual. Uh, the here and now is good enough for us, the here and now is good enough for us, uh, but this is the very program that says focus on the moment and live one day at a time. Now you're saying the here and now is good enough for arrogant, successful people uh, who have abandoned religion, and that's a terrible, and that's a terrible thing. Uh. <laughs> Finally, when all our scorecards read zeros, and we saw that one more strike would put us out of the game forever, we had to look for our lost faith. No, sorry, that's not how it works. You're describing a fairy tale scenario situation that's probably never existed. You're outlining this idea that somehow or the other I was raised religious and got all this good moral training, which, by the way, is not true, that somehow I, I, I uh, uh, gained material success and self-sufficiency in life. It failed me because I was a drinker. It failed me because I had a severe problem with alcohol. And now the only way out is to return to my lost faith in my childhood, even though they'll tell you that religion is for people afraid of hell and AA is for people who have already been there. This is just, this is total mumbo-jumbo bullshit. And he goes on to say, the intellectually self-sufficient man or woman is another kind of problem. To these, many AAs can say, yes, we were like you, far too smart for our own good. Well, Bill W. really does hate smart people, doesn't he? We love to have people call us precocious. I, I've never loved to have people call me precocious. I don't know what he's talking about. We used our education to blow ourselves up into prideful balloons, though we were careful to hide this from others. What? <laughs> you're, you're telling me that nobody uh, ever achieved higher education in the hope of gaining a better uh, ground in, in, in employment. You're telling me that nobody ever went to medical school to become a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer, or, or nobody went to trade school to become an electrician or a... Uh, you know, or an electrical engineer or a plumber or a mechanic or anything like that. Everybody who got any kind of higher education whatsoever, they didn't do it to uh, to pursue maybe a passion in a trade that they were passionate about. They didn't do it to uh, to actually make more financial money. They did it because they wanted to blow up their pride and ego and, and, and hide that pride and ego from everybody else. You know, oh, I don't like to tell anybody this. But I read a lot of books last night. <laughs> I'm so smart. I'm so much smarter than everybody else. Is that what he really thinks that people get educated for? I mean, <laughs> oh my God. Secretly, we felt we could float above the rest of the folks on our brain power alone. No, nobody ever secretly said on brain power alone, I can float above everybody else. I, to my knowledge, nobody has ever done that. 
The average human being wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I hope nothing bad happens. I hope I'm not in a car crash today on the way to work. I hope my employer keeps me and I don't get laid off. Uh, when I turn on the news and I hear about possible economic disasters or something to do with the climate that could create all kinds of unknown catastrophes, I hope it doesn't come true because I really want to hold on to my life as it is. Uh, do you really believe that people wake up in the morning and say, I don't have any problems today because I can float above my brain power alone, and that's why I drink? Uh, this, is, this is just dumb! <laughs> Scientific progress told us there was nothing man couldn't do. Scientific progress has never said that. Scientific progress acknowledges there's all kinds of mysteries of the universe, but I will tell you this, scientific progress has enabled us to travel into the skies above us to develop cures for certain diseases that were once thought uh, impossible to, to do anything about, has enabled us to split the atom, has enabled us to have running water and electricity, refrigerators, and, and, and a whole host of other things. What is Bill W.'s spirituality ever done for the good of humanity? The God of intellect displaced the God of our fathers. More emotional horseshit language. No, nobody ever said that. No, no, I mean, this is just another. This is just another high-handed religious sermon. Uh, but again, John Barleycorn had other ideas. We who had won so handsomely in a walk turned into all-time losers. In other words, we developed an addiction, and the addiction that got control of our life and kind of ruined it. Uh, had nothing to do with a God of intellect. Had nothing to do with us saying the God of our fathers doesn't exist any longer. By the way, uh, the concept of God evolves all the time. You don't see nobody in this particular culture uh, saying people should be burned at the stake for preaching the wrong gospel any longer. You don't see people being hung for, for working on the Sabbath or something like that. You don't see anything like the Salem witch trials any longer. You don't see those kinds of things in modern society, in this culture anyway, because of progress. Nobody would even dream of arguing something like that anymore. I mean, you do have religious fundamentalist lunatics that would love to see society return to a life like that, but on the whole, in general, people do not look at that uh, like that any longer. It was kind of like my aunt was talking about how, you know, some young teacher she knew got pregnant, was sent away in disgrace, uh, you know, and everybody pretended that, you know, she had to go away for a little while, you know. Let's not talk about her. No, we don't live like that any longer because we're evolving past that kind of horse shit. Whereas Bill W. wants us to return to that, I guess. But he wants us to bend over and, and, and bend the knee to him and kiss his ass uh, to, to this horse shit, uh, fundamentalist religious stuff, uh, because we had a drinking problem. Uh, and I, I, I realize the time here, but I, I haven't rounded it all off here. We saw that we had to reconsider or die. We had to reconsider or die. In other words, you got a drinking problem, but you got to find faith or die. Uh, but I thought there were no busts in AA. We found many in AA who once thought as we did. They helped to get us down to our right size. For example, they showed us that humility and intellect could be compatible, provided we placed humility first. What? <laughs> Nobody in AA is humble, for one thing. Have you ever seen the old-timer hegemony? You ever seen those old-timers that are so full of themselves that they're overjoyed? When somebody commits suicide or somebody drinks himself to death, some have to die so that others can live. And you're telling me that they're humble? And, and, and where do you get the authority that we have to place humility first? Where do you get any of this from? Do you, get, do, you, do you have any scientific basis, in fact, to cover any of this up, or are you just making all these proclamations? Uh, when we began to do that, we received the gift of faith, the faith which works. This faith is for you, too. I wanted to finish to round it off to something here before I read a subscriber comment, but this is nothing but one big appeal to religious conversion. This is one big appeal to somebody who has a drinking problem saying, you know what, you are, you're somebody who either wandered away from your childhood faith, you're somebody uh, who gave up because you thought you were so smart, and now you're fucking drunk and a fucking loser, and the only thing you can do is adopt my faith and die. That's all it is in a nutshell. Anyway, in 30 minutes, <laughs> I've gone on a little longer than I intended to. Uh, but like I said, I do want to introduce a new tradition of reading a subscriber comment at the end of every video. So I'm going to read this one. Uh, it's a couple of weeks ago. And this is very apt, so I'm going to include it here. Going to meetings is also its own trap. You go because you need a meeting, and you need a meeting because you've been conditioned to constantly need a meeting. In its own way, it can also be like running away from life, hiding away in the rooms instead of spending time with your family and friends, especially sometimes when they keep, need you most. 
You may be going to meetings in part because you keep telling yourself, maybe I'll hear something good this time. You forget all the bad advice, misplaced authority people often try to assume over you, all the toxic projections they place onto you because, after all, you're also an alcoholic. Truth is, you'll usually find far more emotionally healthy and mature people outside of the rooms rather than inside of them. And I think closing with subscriber comments every video is a good way to go here rather than just trailing off. Till next time.